ready to go ahead? Can I introduce you? I'm, I'm ready to go when you are. Excellent. Then it's my pleasure to announce the last talk of this conference, uh, Martin Olson from Berkeley, who will speak on the classification of variety and variety. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let me begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to participate in the conference and to speak. Um, and as the last speaker, I also have the pl privilege of thanking you on behalf of all of us for uh, putting together this terrific conference. Uh, so maybe we can do our best to give a nice round of applause for the organizers. Uh, Okay, so um, let me start the screen share. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, joint work um, with uh, Max Lieblake. at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, if you want to read more, there's a, uh, an archive preprint uh, with the title Derived uh, Categories and uh, by Rationality. Um, Okay, so um, let me, so the motivation, let me start quite vague. So throughout, I'll be working over some field K. Uh, later, there will be some assumptions on K, but uh, the general uh, discussion is over any field. And I'm going to be interested in a smooth uh, projective variety. Uh, over x, over k, um, and we're interested in studying d of x, uh, the bounded uh, derived category of coherent sheaves. On x. Okay. And um, the basic question that we were playing around with was the following. Um, uh, to what extent is D of X a faithful invariant? Of um, uh, well, faithful invariant. Let me just put it that way. Um, okay, so what does that mean? So, in other words, uh, if you have uh, two varieties, x and y, um, and d of x is equivalent to d of y. Um, when does it follow that uh, X is isomorphic to Y? Okay, um, so that's a very naive question one can ask. And uh, well, there's an easy answer, which is it's not. Um, and that, I think, uh, started with Mukai, I think around 1984, um, early 80s. Um, and so uh, there's a wonderful paper where there are examples of non-isomorphic 
uh, surfaces um, with equivalent um, derived categories um, and uh, well um, that in fact, I maybe should say you you can think about their examples of K3 surfaces. So even if you're interested in sort of birational equivalence, the answer is still no, uh, because of, uh, you know, you have for minimal surfaces. So, um, so that's, I think, the origin of the whole subject of Fourier Mokai transforms and um, you know, there's a, 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 a lot of very interesting math uh, around the failure. Um, but the second part is that it actually seems close in many cases. So, um, so um, well, what's the evidence for that? Um, it is a faithful invariant. Uh, for certain classes. Of varieties. Um, so I'll say more about that. Um, you know, there are many results about finiteness. Uh, of the number of so called Fourier Mokai partners. So up here, uh, if X and Y are two varieties that have equivalent uh, derived categories, then they're called uh, Fourier Mokai partners. And maybe more closely related to this conference, uh, there's a conjecture of Orlov. Um, which says that if you have, if X and Y uh, are smooth projective over our field K, um, then D of X uh, equivalent to D of Y uh, should imply that their motives uh, are isomorphic. So here, uh, let's say child motives, tensor Q. Okay, so um, if that conjecture is true, that means that there's an awful lot of information captured uh, in the derived category, um, such as point counts over finite fields and things like that. Um, I guess in that spirit, I should also say that um, sort of a lot of recent work uh, seems to show that uh, things like crystalline cohomology uh, or um, other invariants of what seems to be true invariants of algebraic varieties uh, often can be defined in terms of the, the, the derived category of coherent sheaves. Please do interrupt with questions. Um, okay, so um, so that was, uh, so maybe we can form, so let me re sort of formulate the basic question. Um, so I'll call it basic question prime, um, sort of what extra structure on uh, D of X uh, would make it a faithful invariant. And the kind of extra structure I want to think about is basically cohomological structure. So, um, I, you know, I, one can answer this question trivially, but uh, I, you know, the kind of thing I'm thinking about is some 
um, close to numerical data I want uh, I want to put in there. Okay, so um, let me begin uh, the discussion in, some, in more detail by talking about some derived invariants. And what do I mean by derived invariants? Um, I mean uh, things that depend uh, only on the derived category or maybe uh, sort of its higher categorical uh, incarnation. So DG category, or you can make it an infinity category if you want, which I'll write it with sort of a curly D there. So that this will be sort of the, maybe the uh, infinity category. Okay, so, um, well, this is a conference uh, on motive. So when I've talked about it in, in the past, I'm gonna skip, I usually skip the next section, but, uh, uh, I've, this is a great opportunity to, I, I'm sort of very happy to do uh, some discussion of what I would call the Mukai motive, um, which I, for me at least, sheds a lot of light uh, on some things in the literature. So um, if you go back to Mukai's original paper, um, so he's working over C, and suppose you consider he's thinking about K3 surfaces. Um, and then there's this uh, funny construction, which is you write down the following. Um, so the H tilde there uh, is defined. You take a, a direct sum. Um, of the cohomologies, but you uh, do some Tate twist to make it pure. Um, so this is a pure hot structure. Um, and uh, he shows that this is a derived invariant. point being that um, the individual cohomology groups are not derived invariants, but uh, when you take this sort of shifted sum, uh, you get a derived invariant. Um, okay, um, so there, there's a motivic interpretation of this, which I learned from looking at a paper of uh, Blanc, Roballo, uh, Toen and Vesozi. Um, okay, and so again, we're over this field K, and um, there's a functor uh, um, from DG cat. So if you consider, uh, well, let me, I'll say it in a moment. Um, So uh, this is a uh, well, triangulated category of motives over K and it's always tensor Q in my discussion today. Um, and this is, uh, well, there's some technical words, infinity category of DG categories over K uh, which should be item potent complete. So, uh, and triangulated. So I don't want to go into this in part because I'm sure there are many people uh, here who know a lot more about that than I do. Um, but the point is that there is such a, uh, um, a, a functor and the key property uh, in regards to what I'm talking about uh, today is that if you start with a smooth projective variety and you apply this functor um, to uh, 
of the curly D of X, the, the, I'll still call it the derived category of coherent sheaves, um, which is an object in here. Um, what you get is infinite direct sum um, of the motive of the variety itself um, with some shifts. In other words, um, if you take just the motive of the derived category of coherent sheaves is the two periodization of um, the motive of X. Okay, so um, this I th is, is a more, you know, sort of direct way to see that um, the derived category of coherent sheaves contains a lot. And, and you recover sort of this Mukai construction. Um, if you have a Bay cohomology theory, you know, so one of the standard Bay cohomology theories, a tau cohomology or a singular cohomology over C or something, um, at least tensor Q. Um, then if you take H0 um, of the motive um, of the derived category of coherent sheaves, uh, you get uh, this direct sum, the even part, which is this Mukai uh, structure. So this is the H tilde of X in Mukai's uh, um, definition. And then you can also take H1 and you get um, just the, the odd cohomology uh, with a suitable Tate twist. Okay. Um, so that's uh, what I would, why, you know, that's a, a, the way I like to think about this uh, Mukai cohomology uh, that, that plays so, a prominent role in, in, in the literature on derived equivalence. Maybe I'll pause if there are any questions. Okay, um, right, so, um, oops. Is there something like a box team that connects, connects H0 and H1? Yes, I, I mean, this, this object really is over, I guess, maybe one, I, I never know how to write this precisely. It has a module over that. <laughs> um, uh, so this is, a, uh, so I guess I could also write it like one unit element, unit take plus or minus. Um, so this is really a module over this algebra that shifts the degrees by two. Um, th does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Um, Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, so, um, well, maybe let me just say what the classical approach is because that's also uh, enlightening. So, um, to, so, um, so first of all, if Orlov, a, a famous theorem of Orlov tells you that if you have an equivalence, Um, of derived categories, uh, it's given by F goes to, uh, you, you have a, this is, I think why it's called a Fourier Mukai transform. Um, you pull back up to the product and then you tensor with some P where there's some fixed P um, in the derived category of the product. Um, and so maybe, I'll write it like this, phi is phi p. Um, in other words, there's a kernel 
for the transform, which uh, means that uh, for the purposes of equivalence, there's every every equivalence lifts to the curly D uh, level. So um, what that means? So if you think about uh, sort of so now if you take the take the motive if you have such an equivalence and you take the motive you get a big matrix of maps uh, which is scrambling up the degrees um, so it has components um, that look like this so you have some s on one side and t's and you have a big matrix uh, of maps and uh, Sort of, if you look at the st entry of that matrix, uh, this is given by um, there are some formulas. So it's a churn character applied to p, and you have to take the square root of the Todd class of the tangent bundle. I think of the up on the product, and then you have to take a suitable um, uh, degree of that. Okay, so there's some formula um, which. Uh, well, so that, 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 that tells you how to do it in terms of churn classes. Um, one advantage of that is that anytime you have churn classes, you also get these maps, right? So you, you can just write this thing down um, and look at the maps. So in particular, um, if you look at Chow groups, um, you can also just write down using the same for, formula the maps. And so let me write um, I'll use the following notation, A upper star X, this will be cycles, tensor Q, uh, modulo uh, numerical equivalence. Okay, so, um, so if you have an equivalence like above, you get uh, a map like this. Um, which is just take the same formula there. Um, and now uh, let me make a definition. Um, we say that, um, Phi is filtered if um, this map on numerical Chow groups uh, preserves the co-dimension filtration. Okay, and so um, we came to study this condition because, well, we did a lot, bunch of examples, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so first of all, so, so but, but we proved, for example, that in the case, case of K3 surfaces, where you do have uh, non-trivial Fourier Mokai partners, if you impose this condition, then that determines the K3 surface up to isomorphism. Um, and so it seemed a natural condition to study, and we like it because it's, numerical equivalence, which is a, uh, you know, a very strong equivalence relation. And so it's sort of cohomological in nature. Okay, so uh, that's the condition uh, we're interested in. Um, let me also mention Huxfield uh, cohomology or homology. Um, which is also a derived invariant. Um, let me write it this way uh, for completeness. Um, the delta is the diagonal, um, and maybe H H I next I um, L delta upper star, delta lower star, OX, OX. Okay, so uh, there are other ways to define this uh, that makes more clear that it's a derived invariant. Um, and um, these have filtrations 
coming from uh, spectral sequences. So I'm hoping I got the indexing right, but uh, the main point is that there are spectral sequences. Um, And um, the D is the dimension goes to HP plus Q of X, H H. Okay, so the, so these are filtered. Uh, vector spaces. And so um, let's say, let me add to my definition here and say that um, uh, phi um, is strongly filtered. Um, if filtered and um, let's see, um, and preserves filtrations on um, H H lower star, H H upper star. Okay, so that's, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, about this condition. Okay, so, um, but again, it's, it's preserving some filtration on some um, cohomological object. Okay, so, uh, well, we're, let me make two remarks. So, it's always a little confusing when you say something is strongly something because which way do, direction is the implication. So strongly filtered implied filter, that's trivial from the definition. Um, and now uh, one reason we're not so sure which is a good, the better condition is that if you're in characteristic zero and uh, the canonical class is trivial, um, then um, filtered is equivalent, it's equivalent to strongly filtered. And so since a lot of the work in the subject deals with the kalabi yau case, the KX uh, being trivial case, um, we don't have a good sense of, of uh, what, what the right condition is. Okay, and so now uh, let me state sort of the main question. I should say um, my collaborator and I go back and forth between whether we should call it a conjecture or a hope or a fantasy. Um, it was very smoky outside yesterday and so uh, I was a little pessimistic, but okay, so let me just, I'm not sure how strongly we should uh, uh, I'll call it a conjecture slash hope, um, which is that if X and Y are uh, smooth projective, um, if there exists a strongly filtered equivalence, Uh, then X and Y are birational. Um, okay, so that's in any case a precise formulation of uh, sort of the, the basic, what we hope is an answer to the basic question. Um, any questions? Could you show the definition of strongly filtered again? Yep. Um, let's see, at least I think there are some things on my screen here. Okay. Um, 
So strongly filtered means filtered, which means preserves co-dimension filtration on uh, numerical Chow groups, plus uh, the condition that it preserves the, fil the natural filtrations on Hochschild homology and cohomology. Thank you. Do you have examples of filtered but not strongly filtered? Um, no, I don't think we do. Um, I mean, one, so let me say, right, so you mean that are also de uh, a, a derived equivalent, which is uh, filtered but not strongly filtered. No, I don't have, um, I don't think I have such an example. Um, I mean, one, one thing of the subject, which is partly why we're asking this question is, I think there are uh, is very few examples of, uh, at least that I know of, of derived equivalences. So it, it seems a very strong uh, condition to say that two varieties are derived equivalent, yet it's very hard to pin down, uh, you know, there, there are interesting derived equivalences. Uh, let me remark that Bridgeland um, has examples. Um, if you look through his papers, of um, uh, strongly filtered equivalences where the varieties are not isomorphic but birational. Okay, so uh, so these examples say that isomorphism is too strong. Okay, um, right, so let me t tell you some results. And uh, well, they're partial results, so to state them, let me uh, introduce some terminology. Um, and notation. Uh, bear with me here. It's it's because I was, you know, they're partial results. So, okay. So let me say that if you have a variety X, uh, filtered Torelli is what FT stands for holds. Um, so I guess I should I should have said that uh, sort of we view these kind of statements as kind of Torelli derived category Torelli theorems, right? So. Uh, just as for a classical Torelli, uh, you look at cohomology, and cohomology in itself is not uh, uh, faithful invariant in situations when we have Torelli theorems, but if you preserve the, you know, the filtration or some kind of uh, extra structure, um, then you have, uh, that, that's what Torelli applies. And, and, and so we view this as kind of a, uh, Torelli type theorems over arbitrary uh, fields. Um, okay, so let me write this way. So whenever, so if you have a variety, you can ask that whenever you have an equivalence, a, a filtered equivalence, uh, D of Y is a filtered equivalence Uh, then X and Y are birational. Okay, so, um, and then I can, let me try to train, change the color here. I can do the same with strongly filtered. So the SFT means that you put in strongly here. Okay. So that's a property of a uh, variety, okay? Um, and similarly, if we have an integer, oops, that's not the same color. Um, if, if you have an integer n, you can ask for uh, every variety of dimension uh, less than or equal to 
to that n uh, has this property. Okay, and let's see, let me go back to my, and likewise put an S there. Okay. So that's some technical uh, definition. Um, so let's see, let me put a theorem, the first theorem here. Um, ah, sorry. Up here, let me put, for the rest of the discussion, uh, characteristic of k being zero. Um, we have some results in positive characteristic, but as I'll explain, uh, there are some obstacles. For, they're not as strong. Okay. Okay. So let's work over an algebraically closed field, characteristic zero. Okay. So the state first statement is that um, you have this uh, filtered uh, equivalence property. Um, if X is in one of the following classes. Uh, so let's see. So one uh, curves and surfaces. Um, abelian varieties uh, three. Um, I'll say three folds with non zero eta cut dimension. Of the canonical or minus the canonical. So that means that if you take sections of the canonical or the anti canonical, uh, you get uh, a map to a, a, a positive dimensional variety. Okay, so that the canonical variety uh, is positive dimensional. Um, let's see, and then we have some other examples. Uh, Let's see, so four cum varieties uh, of abelian three folds. Okay, so there are some examples, uh, but all in low dimension. Um, that was not such great board work, I switched away from the theorem right after writing it. So let me just put it there for a moment. Okay, so those are um, some examples. Let me also mention, so the proofs are sort of inductive. Um, let me also mention that uh, this strong version, um, this holds, for three folds uh, with H one X O X not zero. Okay. Um, right. So those are some results. Um, the proof. Let me put it. In, proofs are uh, related to the following theorem. Um, so let's suppose we have some integer n and x is smooth projective of dimension n plus one. So what there's sort of an induction we do. Um, so one, um, if the eta got dimension of kx or minus kx is non-zero. And the associated vibration is everywhere defined. Um, um, then 
if you know the uh, statements in the, 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 the filtered Torellian dimensions less than or equal to n, that implies that uh, it also holds for your x. Um, second, um, if um, you're in the uh, non-zero h1, um, whoops, what did I do? Um, if this is non-zero um, and uh, ft less than or equal to n, then um, the strong late filter condition holds. Okay, so there's some inductive uh, geometric construction. And so uh, sort of the upshot maybe is that the, the key case uh, that we have a hard time attacking is uh, Kx trivial. That's, that's, that's the, 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 the most difficult case. And so I guess the, the three folds with Kx trivial would be the next uh, interesting case to study. Okay, so um, let me discuss a few elements of the proof. It, there's a lot of technicalities, so I obviously don't want to go through all of that, but uh, I do. There are a few points uh, worth highlighting. Um, so the first point uh, is that um, if this, if you have this filtered equivalence uh, and it's given by a sheaf, by natural sheaf, um, then it's not, then, then things are much easier. Um, and you can see that in this case, the support of P uh, is generically over X, the graph of a birational isomorphism. Okay, and um, let me just draw a picture. Here's your product, x cross y. There's x, there's y. And so um, if you draw the support, so you can use intersection theory, uh, just the numerical intersection theory to conclude that um, the general fiber of the support has to be zero dimensional and uh, then if you look at the pre-image of a point uh, and look at the transform of a skyscraper sheaf um, supported at the point, so that's a skyscraper sheaf at some point x, um, well it's an the Fourier Mackay transform is an equivalence of categories and so uh, that's just the ground field k, let's assume we're over looking at a k-point or, or over an algebraically closed field or something. And that's supposed to be, so if you look at the definition of this transform, that's the endomorphisms of Px, where Px is the restriction, is um, the restriction of P restricted to a fiber, right? So it's, it's on Y. And so if you also know that this is supported on a zero dimensional scheme, uh, that's very hard to to have that happen unless uh, P of X is just um, the, the, the skyscraper sheaf of a point. Okay, so uh, once you have know something about the actual support of, of, the, of the, the kernel, the P, um, then the, 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 the arguments become much easier. So part of the point here and why I mentioned this um, is that 
the game here somehow is to understand something about the difference between numerical equivalence versus um, actual, uh, you know, cycles and how it plays with the derived category. So uh, what do we act know in general? In general, um, what we know, uh, we just know that if you look at the class of this, if you look at a, the restrict the P to a fiber over point in X, that this uh, inside the numerical child groups of Y is the class of a point. Um, but we know nothing about, uh, don't know anything about the actual support, the physical support of the complex. And this goes back to the, the question of examples. I mean, there are examples uh, where the support is, is bigger than what you might think, but uh, there aren't a whole lot of examples. So it will certainly be valuable to have more examples. Um, okay, so that's the first point. Um, and then um, that actually already gives some cases. Uh, let me say that Belian torsors or abelian varieties, uh, let me say it that way. Um, that follows from, there's a theorem of Orlov um, that says that phi uh, is phi p for p a, p a sheaf up to a shift. Okay, so when you have an, uh, an actual sheaf, uh, um, that uh, then you're done. Okay, the other tools we have at our disposal. Um, well, let me say the canonical vibration um, and this comes out of the story of ser functors um, of, uh, I think this is due to Bondel and Kapranov. Um, well, so these are certain functors on the derived category with various properties. And the main point is it's, it's, an, it's an invariant. Um, and in the case of um, our smooth projective X, uh, the, the Sarah functor is given by tensoring with the canonical bundle um, from DX. And so, um, what you get out of that is that if you have an equivalence phi, um, so the, the general theory of serif functors, um, if you have an equivalence, then um, in fact, uh, it's compatible with serif functors, meaning uh, this diagram commutes. SX. Okay, and now why does that tell you that things are compatible with the canonical uh, vibration? Well, uh, the point is that now I can think about the sections of the canonical bundle as, um, well, I would like to say it's this, hom of the identity functor uh, to the nth power of the, of the uh, um, serif functor, that's not quite true because you don't know that all autoequivalences of the derived cat morphism of autoequivalences of the derived category are given by morphisms of the corresponding sheaves, but it's close. And so uh, let me put a prime there. That means that uh, these are morphisms of functors functors uh, that lift to uh, this, the curly D of X. Okay, and so um, the point being that the identity functor is given by this 
on, oh, on x cross x. And you see here that the, the ser functor is given by also the transform defined by a sheaf, right? And so it's delta lower star kx shifted, and maybe I should put a shift there. Uh, but anyway, the point is that you can describe um, what are sections of the canonical sheaf purely in terms of these auto equivalences of the derived category, which are preserved, of course, under equivalence uh, because of the uniqueness of the ser factor. Okay, and so then um, that tells you that the canonical ring of a variety is a derived invariant. And uh, if you have these vibrations um, to the canonical varieties, and similarly for Y, um, um, so you can think about this. And so if you have your uh, filtered equivalence, it's going to, it's going to pass to an equivalence on the uh, generic fibers. Um, maybe I'll write it like that. The generic fiber of this vibration. Um, over an isomorphism of fields, um, kappa, so uh, maybe I'll say a to x. So a to x here is a generic point. That's terrible handwriting. But a to x is a generic point of this canonical variety. And so uh, you get an isomorphism like that. And that the, the um, um, derived equivalence passes to the, those generic fibers. And then you can try to do some inductive argument uh, as in the theorems. Okay, so that's a, a, a fairly well-known tool um, using this canonical vibration. And so from this now, uh, well, you get curves. You can, the, the same argument I should point out works if you have, if the minus kx is ample, right? You put the, the morphisms of functors in the other direction. Uh, they're still preserved. So you can also understand sections of minus kx. Um, and from that, you, you can do the case of curves, the one case being that doesn't follow from this canonical vibration argument is the elliptic curve case, which is a, uh, follows from the Abelian variety case. Um, and now uh, we mark that the surfaces case, uh, we do by case by case analysis. which is, uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of geometry of surfaces involved. I don't think I have time for that here, um, but uh, it's, it's a fun thing in my opinion. Um, okay, um, right. So let me mention the other key ingredient, which is what I'll call uh, Rukier functors. Um, so what is that? Uh, well, a Rukier functor is an audio equivalence um, of a, the derived category uh, given by a complex of the form. Um, gamma sigma lower star L, where um, gamma sigma is the graph of an automorphism of the variety, and I want it to be in the connected component of the identity of the automorphism group of the variety. Um, and L is a numerically trivial uh, line bundle on X. Um, okay, and so, um, well, what are these classified by? They're uh, sort of Rukier factors. Um, so it's a, it's a graph of an automorphism and a line bundle. Uh, it's classified by, uh, it's actually a nice uh, stack, uh, Rx0, that lives over pig knot of x cross the automorphism uh, group of x. 
Um, it's a GM gerb. So, so we're basically talking about the product of these co connected components, pick naught and odd zero. Okay. Um, and Rukier uh, showed that this uh, showed that uh, that Rukier functors are preserved under derived equivalence. In other words, if I have an equivalence between dx and dy, and I conjugate a Rukier functor, then it's again a Rukier functor. Okay. Um, and so I'll say it this way: Rx zero is a derived invariant. It's a beautiful argument. Um, and um, so what does that mean? So that means that if you have this equivalence, um, that induces for you a map from pig naught of x uh, to uh, pig naught of y cross at um, zero y. Okay, so we get that equivalent, that isomorphism. Um, and now what we would like to do is, uh, so what, we want to have that this, uh, this preserves pig naught. Okay, so normally it scrambles everything up um, and, but we wanted to preserve pig naught because uh, then we can use the Albanese vibration, Albanese map, and induction on dimension. So it's a, there's a tricky argument there, but uh, the main point is um, if we can, uh, if we have that these uh, pig knots are preserved, uh, then we can do something similar to what I was alluding to for the canonical vibration, now using the Albanese vibration. And so the key point here is whether or not this pig knot component is preserved under this functor. Okay, now sometimes you can just argue this directly. For example, if pig knot is an abelian variety and odd zero y is an affine algebraic group, then you know that there can't be a cross term uh, in this map uh, going in that direction. And so then you get that. Um, so that's useful, but in general, um, this is where the filter condition comes in. If you look at the tangent space of this map, uh, what you're looking at is H1 XOX direct sum H0 XTX mapping to H1 Y O Y direct sum H zero Y T Y. And then as you might expect, uh, this is uh, what you see when you look at Huxfield uh, homology or cohomology. I can't remember which. And so the filtration condition, filtration condition, strongly filtered condition, geometrically uh, in this situation implies that pig knot of X uh, maps to pig naught of y. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, I think I'm basically out of time. There's a lot more to say, uh, but um, let me in particular just mention that um, in the paper, there's also a version for open varieties, um, which uh, um, may have some interest. So there's a compactly supported version. Um, anyway, so maybe I'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the talk. So are there any questions, comments? Yeah, I have a question about um, this filter derived equivalence and motivic equivalence. Is, does one imply the other? 
Oh yeah, so I should say, yeah, so in the paper, in the last section, um, we show that if you uh, assume the existence of a motivic T structure, uh, so, okay, so this includes the standard conjectures. Uh, okay, so if you make that assumption, then a filtered, if you have a filtered uh, derived um, equivalence, uh, then the motives are isomorphic. So it gives you sort of a, 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 a an Orlov conjecture modulo huge conjectures. Right. Okay. Right. And but in the but other direction, the, uh, do you have any thoughts? Is it? Um, well, it. I have a. I don't have a good sense of how. Well. Not not well formed thoughts. <laughs> so let me, I mean. Uh, Okay. So you're asking if the motives are isomorphic, can you prove by rationality? Is that is that is that the question? Um, well, or filtered filtered uh, derived equivalence. Does a motivic uh, equivalence induce a filtered derived equivalence? Um, right. So I mean, so one thing that's very mysterious to me um, in the Orlov conjecture is that you know if you think about um, so. I mean, there's a very concrete way to that I think of Orlov's conjecture, which is uh, you take the motive of um, the derived category. And so now you get this direct, you know, you get this, all these kind of cross terms. So you have a big matrix, right? Um, that doesn't mean that when you pass to the diagonal of that matrix that you have an isomorphism, <laughs> right? And, and right. sort of the filtered condition sort of tells you that the matrix is upper triangular. <laughs> Oh, but doesn't right. that automatically and, and, and that so that and that's how we get that the motives are isomorphic yeah but then um, why do you need conjectures for that it sounds like that's 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 assuming the all these conjectures yeah but but now i need to, that's assuming the conjectures because i need to know things about numerical equivalence and and you know we're 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 only working with numerical equivalence so oh, I, I see i see gotcha. um yeah yeah i see okay okay thanks thanks yeah. very much yeah. Other further questions? So, so what about the converse of your conjecture? I mean, if you have a birational derived equivalence, is it automatically strongly filtered? Um, I don't think I know that. Um, I'd have to think about that. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, and you also said something about positive characteristic? Um, well, I mean, so I guess, yeah, so the point of positive characteristic is, is that this argument with the Rukier functors breaks down when you have non-reduced Picard. Um, and, and so that's, that's, I would say, the main obstacle in, in positive characteristic. Um, so, so more work is needed there. But, but can you do A, B, C, D, E? No. Uh, let's see. So I'd have to look in the paper, but certainly a lot of the surfaces was done um, in positive characteristic. So um, maybe not characteristic two or something. Um, certainly the curve case. Um, let's see, A. Yeah, I think the Beelan variety case is also okay. Yeah, so so this is this is uh, the stuff about the canonical vibration is general, I believe. So um, yeah, so the main point is when we get to this part about the the Rukier functors. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, are there further questions? So oh, this does not seem to be the case, then let's thank Martin Olsen again. So goodbye everyone, enjoy your weekend. <laughs>